Thank you for joining us for the True Life Fellowship Church podcast. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12 and meet me at verse 22. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 22. I want you to pray with me, pray for me. This is a message that I'm going to bring today that I've never brought before. The Lord showed this to me several months ago and in times of prayer, I felt like he wanted me to deliver this word to you today. And uh, we're going to pick up here in verse 22. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me, And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. You know we are living in a time that there are a lot of people falling away from the faith. There are a lot of people quitting on Christianity. They're quitting on their walk with God. The word the Bible uses is apostasy, which is the great falling away from the faith, turning their back on which once they have believed. An apostate is someone that has willfully and deliberately turned their back on Jesus. And in the times that we live in now, I am hearing and seeing uh, ministers that used to believe one way are now believing a totally different way. I'm seeing ministers that have left the ministry or have had to be, uh, what's the word, put out, (laughs) for lack of a better word, because they're no longer preaching the gospel. They're preaching another gospel that's not the word of God. And in this time, in this season, we're seeing it happen a lot. I was thinking about a man that I know who loves God. Man, he loved, or I should use the word loved God. Man, he was on fire for God, loved God. And then, all of a sudden, he no longer wants to have anything to do with God, though no longer wants to have anything to do with his word, and now he's considering himself an atheist. Now this man loved, loved God, and now he, he doesn't know if God even exists anymore. There are people that grew up in homes that believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, loved the Lord Jesus Christ, and now they're agnostic, meaning they don't know what's right and what's wrong. We, every single day, You and I are in a sewage of anti-Christian rhetoric. What we hear on TV, what we see in the news, what you hear at work, what Pookie talking about, what Ray Ray talking about is all anti-Christian garbage. And we are in this every single moment of every day. I like cell phones, but I kind of wish we didn't have cell phones because now this thing is with me telling me anti-Christian stuff all the time, all the time. Social media, everybody's got an opinion, everybody's got a microphone, and it's anti-Christian. And so it is really, really, truly important that we are a part 
of the body of Christ, that we come to church, that we are a community of believers, that we are spurring and stirring one another to love and good works, that we are hearing a good word. I talk to people all the time that haven't come back to church after COVID, and it's like you are listening to garbage all week, not by your choice, by the way. It's just in your face. And then you don't see the importance of returning into a community, the house of the Lord, so that you can be encouraged, so that you can be stirred up, so that you can be edified. And we see in this passage of scripture, in Mark, Matthew chapter 12, what we just read, there's this man, he's demon-possessed, and he's blind, and he is mute. Now this man, he's got a lot of things going on. I mean, our hearts should go out to a fella that is demon-possessed, blind, and can't speak. He's mute. And Jesus heals him. Glory to God. Jesus is a healer. Everybody that came to Jesus got healed. Did you, did you hear me say that? Everybody that came to Jesus got healed. They received their healing. Everybody received their healing who came to Jesus. And this man who's blind, can't see, mute, can't speak, and he's possessed by a demon, Jesus heals him. This should be a celebratory event, a momentous occasion. Jesus heals this man because scripture tells us now he can see and now he can speak. And as Jesus has performed this miraculous miracle showing us who God is, Jesus is the visible display of the invisible God. He is God in the flesh. And so God's will is to heal. Jesus is going to perform God's will. This man is broke, busted, disgusted. This man is possessed. This man is experiencing the effects of the curse. He encounters Jesus and Jesus heals him. Glory to God. That should happen every single time. Every single time. And so people get excited about this. They said, this must be the son of David. This must be the son of God. This must be the anointed one. This must be the Christ, the Messiah, the one we're looking to. And then the Pharisees says, nah, this ain't him. This man is casting demons out by Beelzebub, who is a demon himself. And basically, the Pharisees are saying Jesus is working with Satan to cast demons out. So what they're saying is literally Jesus is demon-possessed. And he's casting demons out by the power of Satan. This is so slanderous. This is so deliberate. It is so wrong on all levels because the Pharisees should know better. They should know. They didn't deny that the man was demon-possessed. They didn't deny that the man was blind. They didn't deny that the man was mute. They knew all that was true. They didn't deny that the man no longer had a demon. They didn't deny that the man could speak. They didn't deny that the man could see. What they denied was the power of God that caused the man to be free, to be able to see, and to be able to speak. They denied the power of God, and they said, Satan is the one that's performing these works. So, so, so wrong on every level possible. So then Jesus says, listen, Satan is evil, essentially, these are my words. Satan is evil, but he's not stupid. He's not going to cast demons out and divide his own kingdom. And, you know, he now all of a sudden he's commanding demons to get out of people. No, Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Satan wants to tear up humanity. Satan wants humanity to be broke, busted, and disgusted, to be blind and not be able to speak, to be possessed with his demons. Why would he want to cast his own demons out? And Jesus makes a good point. He goes on there and say, if I cast the demon out and if I made this man see and made this man speak by the power of God, then surely you're going to have to admit that the kingdom of God is among you. 
I am here and I'm among you. You're going to have to admit that. Then he goes into, you got to plunder a strong man. And you, when you go in there, somebody stronger is going to take over who's already there to plunder, which means to drive him out. And then I'm going to bring in the spirit of God. He goes into all of that. But then he says something really, really important. And it's found in verse 31. And let's put that back on the screen. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31. I like what he says here. He says, therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. And let's look at verse 32. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, before I dissect this verse for you and bring you some understanding, I used to be very, very afraid that I committed blasphemy. How many of you in here have felt like you have committed blasphemy? I got some honest people in the house today. When I, especially when I was younger, I felt like I committed the unpardonable sin. I have committed the unforgivable sin. I have blasphemed God and I have blasphemed Jesus, and I will be denied at the end of my existence. If you're honest with yourself, you've probably had some guilt along those lines. I used to feel guilty because I believe it's in Matthew chapter 10, I believe, where it says, if you deny me before men, Jesus said, then I'm going to deny you before my Father. And I used to be like, I don't want to wear that Christian shirt because somebody's going to think uh, I'm a Christian and I don't, I don't want them to know I'm a Christian because, you know, I might do a little bad stuff, you know what I mean? And I don't want them to know I'm a Christian. I'm not going to wear that shirt. Oh, I denied him. And when I get to heaven or when I, at the end of my life, because I'm not going to make it to heaven, right? Jesus is going to deny me entrance into heaven. I, 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 used, to, I used to think that. I used to think that I've committed some blasphemous sin and I've denied, there have been several occasions where the Lord told me, I need you to witness to this person, to tell this person about me, share my love with them, and I don't do it. And I've denied him. I'm not going to heaven. And there has been some teaching along those lines that's, that's entirely false, and I'll tell you about that later. But no, that, that's not it. Obviously, we should be witnesses. Obviously, our purpose on the earth is to be the arms and legs of Jesus. Obviously, we should be a mouthpiece, and we should share the goodness of God with humanity. We should want to let them know the good things God has done for us. We should. But that's not denial in what Jesus is talking about. Matter of fact, it, we've seen this, that people are turning away from the body of Christ. Uh, in Matthew, uh, I believe it's Matthew 12, he also talks a little bit about that, that, in, that lawlessness will occur, right? And that people's hearts will grow cold. And the love of many, their hearts will grow cold and that they will turn away. But we're going to have to endure to the end. And so we see here when Jesus says, if you blaspheme Jesus, or the Son of Man, you can be forgiven. Matter of fact, he says, any blasphemy will be forgiven. That's what he says, plainly, that it'll be forgiven. And if you blaspheme the Son of Man, which is Jesus, you're going to be forgiven. But if you blaspheme the Spirit of God, this is where it becomes what we get, the unpardonable or the unforgivable sin. And the Lord was talking to me about this, and I'm going somewhere, so you don't have to stay with me. You can blaspheme Jesus, and blaspheme literally means that you are willful and you are deliberate in your ignorance. <laughs> you are willful and you are deliberate in your opposition to something. And so what Jesus is telling us, you may not know who Jesus is. The people in, these, in, the, in the world out here, they're willful. I'm sorry, they're ignorant as to know who Jesus is. They don't know Jesus. Um, they're going to probably slander Jesus. They don't know Jesus. They're going to say some bad things. They're going to maybe put a cuss word in front or after it. They, they don't know Jesus. Jesus is telling us that can be forgiven. But when you attack the Spirit of God, 
which is the power of God, which is God himself. When you willfully and deliberately attack the, the vehicle by which you know Jesus, when you willfully and deliberately attack the instrument, the, the path, by which you know Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit. We cannot say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12. We can't declare. The Holy Spirit is the one that illuminated Jesus unto us. The Holy Spirit is the one that revealed Jesus to us. The Holy Spirit is the one that's told us that we needed a Savior. The Holy Spirit is the one that's convicted us of our sin. Jesus is saying, if you slander the Spirit of God, Willfully and deliberately, the path by which you know Jesus, if you slander the path by which you know Jesus, there is no return. There's no return. Now, here's what's important, and I have to say this now. If you have conviction of mis doings and sin and, and, and iniquity and, and you, you're convicted by the Spirit of God, you have not committed blasphemy, okay? If you want to do what's right and do it right because it's right, you've not committed blasphemy. If you are just yearning in your heart to hear the Word of God and obey the Word of God, you've not committed blasphemy. I want you to understand this. The person that has committed blasphemy is the person that has willfully and deliberately, knowingly rejected the Spirit of God and ultimately rejected Jesus. They turned their back on Jesus. Now, go to Hebrews chapter 4 real quick. I want you to see something. Hebrews chapter 4. No, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 6, forgive me. Hebrews chapter 6, and meet me at verse 4. Hebrews chapter 6, meet me at verse 4. Watch this. For it is um, impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now that was a mouthful, and I want to break this down for you. Let's back up to verse 4. It is impossible. Somebody shout impossible. impossible. Now this is important. Impossible. God doesn't use the word impossible a lot. The writer of Hebrews, who I believe is the Apostle Paul, he, we don't use the word impossible a lot, right? Because with God, all things are possible. So he's saying here, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. And I want to spend some time on this word enlightened. Enlightened means that you've heard the gospel and you were enlightened that you were a sinner. And that you needed a savior. And you recognized your need for a savior. How many of you remember your salvation experience? When you knew that, man, I need help. I need Jesus. I have no way to compensate for my sin. I need someone to take my sin away. I need a relationship with the Father. I can't do this on my own. I remember being an eight-year-old boy realizing that I was a sinner and I needed Jesus. That's enlightened. I was enlightened. Thank God. Would you just take a moment, just lift your hands and thank God that you were enlightened? There, there are so many people that have not been enlightened. Can you imagine, just for a moment, I'll digress, but just for a moment, imagine not knowing Jesus. And there's millions, if not billions, of people that don't know Jesus. Imagine them just walking around, not knowing Jesus. You know how hard life is now, knowing Jesus? Imagine not knowing Jesus. They haven't been enlightened, and part of our role is to enlighten them. And so, 
Here, the writer of Hebrews says, for it's impossible for those who were once enlightened, watch this, and have tasted the heavenly gift. This means you have received salvation. You were enlightened, you knew your need for a savior, and then you've tasted the heavenly gift, you received Jesus as your savior. Now you've experienced salvation. Watch this. Who have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. That means you receive the Holy Spirit. That means you have shared experiences with the Holy Spirit. How many of you here today have had shared experiences online? You have had undeniable experiences with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has made a mark on your life that cannot be erased. You become a partaker of the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, and have tasted the good word of God. That means that you're not... Uh, simply drinking the milk of the word, you're eating the meat, the meat of the word. Uh, Thomas sends me a, a text every Sunday after the message, and he sends me a picture of a steak. <laughs> you know, in emoji, he goes, brother, that was a steak today. It, it, you, you tasted the good word of God, right? And, and, and you're, this doesn't apply to baby Christians. You, you've tasted the word. You, this is referring to mature Christians that you've received the solid meat of the word. How many of you have received the solid meat? If you've been with me long enough, you've received the solid meat of the word and, and you've had some degree of spiritual growth. Is that you? You've grown spiritually and you fully understand the seriousness of who it is that you are serving and who he is in you. You've tasted the good word of God. And then it says here, and the powers of the age to come. That means you are mature and you have experienced miracles. How many of you have experienced some miracles? You've operated in the gifts of the spirit. You've operated in the fruit of the spirit. And now you are a, you're, 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 you've, re, you've received the powers of the age to come. You're a mature believer with experiences with the Holy Spirit. How many of you qualify for all five of them? Raise your hand in here if you qualify for all five. You're, you're saved. Bless God, or you knew you needed a Savior, then you gave your life to Jesus, you received the Holy Spirit, you've had experiences with the Holy Spirit, you received good word, you qualify for all five. Now watch this. Hebrews tells us that it is impossible for those who have experienced all five, if they fall away, to renew them again, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So, what am I saying? I'm saying if you, well, let me say it this way. It is very hard to be a candidate to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It is very difficult because you have to have experienced all five. This is a catch-22, by the way. You've had to experience all five to even be a candidate to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. But here's the catch-22. Because you have experienced all five, it's very easy to fall away, to stop reading your Bible, to stop listening to good teaching of the word, to stop coming to church and being part of a, a community, to stop walking in your purpose and plan. It, it's very easy to become a candidate to blaspheme. I've said this before publicly, and I'll say it again. I believe you're really only three months away from not reading your word, not spending time with God, not hanging out with fellow like-minded mature believers, not coming to church consistently. I believe you're only three months away from literally saying, you know, I don't know about this God stuff. We're seeing it happen. We're seeing it happen. I'm thinking about a, a, a friend now who just, he don't know about God stuff no more. Well, what church are you in? I, I'm, I'm not, I don't go to church no more. You read the Bible? I don't, I don't read the Bible no more. You know, I'm starting to find out it's just a, it's a man-made book. Now, this man was on fire for the Lord. Had experiences with the Lord. Heard some good teaching. And he stepped away. And it's a slippery slope to become a candidate to just simply step away. Now, 
I need to say this because I don't want to leave you with any guilt. You cannot simply get, uh, how can I say it, uh, have a moment of frustration and just say, oh, my, I don't know about God no more. I mean, I, I, that money didn't come in. I don't know about God no more. That ain't it. That's just a moment of frustration. That ain't it. Right? I, you know what, man? I, I, don't, I don't know, and you cuss. I, I just cuss, and I, you know, I cuss. And I, I don't know about that. That, that ain't it. That, you don't accidentally do this. This is a willful and deliberate decision that is made by a candidate who knows better. This is why the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12 were in trouble because they knew better. They knew that the demons wasn't casting demons out. This is why he said to them, well, who do your exorcists cast demons out then by? They knew better, but they willfully and deliberately slandered the Spirit of God. And at that moment, Jesus is not going to get back on the cross and die again a second time because he already did it one time. And so if you turn your back, matter of fact, go to Hebrews chapter 10 and let's look at verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. He says, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now pause. When I was growing up in the Baptist church, the way they taught this verse was, if you know you lied, and you know you know you're about to lie, and you lied anyway, you're gonna have to get saved again. You had to come back to the altar and get, and every week I was walking up, giving my how many know what I'm talking about? You had to get you had to give your life back to the Lord because you committed some willful sin. You knew you was gonna sin. When you told that lie, you knew it was a lie. And you lost your salvation. It's, it's gone because you willfully sin. I've had people try to convince me that that was true, that you did a willful sin and you knew better, you're going to have to say the sinner's prayer again, right, and give your life back to it. That's not what it's talking about. Matter of fact, uh, 1 John tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's, that sins you know you did, that sins you didn't know you did. Bless God, he, he's going to forgive us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 tells us that we have an advocate with the Father Christ Jesus that if we sin, I like when he says if we sin, not when we sin, because we're not supposed to be sinning. Are you listening to me? If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus. He is a propitiation for our sins. He's the sacrifice for our sins. So God is taking care of the sin problem. You cannot commit blasphemy by a continuation of sin. Listen to me now. Uh-oh, Siri, don't. I'm not talking to you, Siri. <laughs> She's doing some research for me. She said, he fired up. You, you, can't sin, you can't sin your salvation away. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. You, you can't sin it away. Now, Paul tells us, well, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? <laughs> God forbid we should keep sinning so that grace may abound. No, you can't sin it away. You can't accidentally lose it. But we're coming to a time as we get closer to the return of Jesus that Satan is going to try to deceive us into thinking through the spirit of the world that what we once believed is no longer true. And we'll stop seeing things as black and white and we'll start seeing things as gray. And when we start seeing things as gray, we stop being holy like God is holy. And then eventually we'll start to come over to see things Satan's way. I'm trying to give you a warning today. And we'll get over here and then we might say, well, I don't know if Mary really was a virgin in Scripture. And that's a big argument today right now. People are drawn away. Well, I don't really know if Jesus really did die on the cross. Well, Scripture said he was buried, so he was dead. 
But I don't, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. Maybe he was still alive when he was buried and he came up. You'll start getting into that. And then before you know it, I don't know about Jesus anymore. I know you said, no, not me, Pastor. I've seen people stronger than you fall away. Fall away because the spirit of the world got a hold of them. But let me get back to Hebrews chapter 10, 26. So he says here, if we sin willfully, this is, that has nothing to do with missing the mark, making a mistake willfully. There are times, can I be honest, I'm not, uh, I'm not proud of it, but you know, I, I say something to my wife and I know she don't like that, you know, and, and I still am saved. I asked her to forgive me later, but I'm still saved. Amen. Amen. I'm still saved. So this is not about you said something and you willfully did it. No. This is talking about willful denying of Jesus. So you can commit blasphemy one of two ways. You can reject Jesus or reject the gospel message and say that ain't, that ain't real. Or you can once be enlightened and have a willful denial or a deliberate denial of Jesus where you have done this intentionally. Now, I... I have to say this as well. How many of you, you know, you've heard these stories. This is happening to our brothers and sisters all over the world where they are having, they're losing their lives because they profess in Jesus. This is our brothers and sisters that are happening right now. They can't meet openly like we're meeting. They are hiding. And if they get caught, someone's going to cut their head off. This is happening. This is not a fairy tale or a fable. This is happening. Do you know Jesus? Yes. Cut your head off. And I used to think, Lord, if I was ever in that situation, and I got a family, and I got responsibilities, would I be bold enough to say, yes, I know Jesus. There's a, there's a sword across my throat. There's a gun close to my head. Do you know Jesus? And I would ask, am I strong enough in that moment to say, yes, I do, and go ahead and do what you got to do? Am I, am I talking to somebody? Could I, could I be like my brothers and sisters overseas that are saying yes and lining up and losing their life? Could, I know I'm a preacher. I know I'm a pastor. I, I know I publish books, and, and I, I know I'm on YouTube, and I, but could, could, I, could I do it? And I used to be terrified by that thought, like, I don't know, if you put me in that situation, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, what, what is Zage going to do? You know, I'm gone. What is, Zarek, I want to be there. Can I do it? And the Lord spoke something to me as I was reading this passage. Look, look real quick at Hebrews 10, 26 again, and read the first five words out loud. Ready? Read. The word willfully stood out to me. And in this passage, we're talking about the sin of rejecting Jesus, denying Jesus. And the Lord spoke to me, and I'll prove it to you, but he spoke to me. He said, that's not a willful situation. That's a pressure situation. That's a situation of duress and stress and a lot of agony and pressure. And God's not going to say, if someone were to say, I don't know Jesus because you have a gun to your head. He's not going to say, well, that was it. You're not welcome here anymore. No, that wasn't a willful, deliberate decision. That was a pressure, stress-related, duress decision that you may have said something. You didn't even know what you said. No, 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 no. You don't even know what you said to get out of that situation the Lord spoke to me and said, I am not holding those people from coming to heaven. Glory to God. Some of you have friends that have committed suicide. And it's been taught. That if you commit suicide, that's, that's an unforgivable sin. That's nowhere found in the scriptures. Not one verse. So I don't believe a good, gracious God who you have come to this place of pressure and stress. And you're overwhelmed. And you've been attacked and attacked and you haven't maybe done the things that you knew were right, like getting into a community, talking to someone about it, and you took your life. God forbid you should take your life because we can help you, right? 
But I don't believe God, you pass and God says, oh, you committed blasphemy. You're not coming to heaven. I don't, I don't believe that's the case. There's no scripture to support that. And I also don't believe that if you were in a situation and that you were about to deny Jesus with a gun in your head, to your head, and you say, I don't know him, that you don't go to heaven no more. Some of you are looking like, are you serious? Well, let me give you an example. What did Peter do? <laughs> he said, I don't even know the man. He said it three times in the same night. And one time he cussed. He cussed and said, I don't know the man. He denied him. Denied him. And he is the, the rock, the, the pillar, one of the pillars of our foundation, the writer of New Testament. And he denied him three times. You think God, because you had a sword to your neck and you said, I, I don't know him, going to send you to hell and can use a guy like Peter who said it three times in one night? I don't know the man. He had just spent the, the, uh, three years with him every single day. I don't know the man. What happened? Pressure. Stress. Duress. It wasn't willful. He was overwhelmed because of the circumstance. Now watch this. His heart was still pliable. His heart, this is why Jesus came back to him in John chapter 21, came back to him and said, do you love me? He said, you know I love you. Do you love me? You, you know I love you. Do you love me? Will you tell me, Lord, if I love you? Redeemed. Forgiven, moved on. But there's coming a time, Pastor, why are you preaching this? Because there's coming a time that the enemy is trying to even deceive the elect. Get them off course to willfully and deliberately deny the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was doing some study, and they said, now we're talking about seminary students, people that go to school to preach. Six out of ten of them don't believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, ridiculous numbers. Complete willful denial. Deliberate. It's not ignorance. It's deliberate. There's no sacrifice for that. Jesus is not going to die on the cross again and say, okay, you don't believe the first time, let me do it again. Mm -mm. I did it one time, once and for all. 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 The enemy, if he can't, listen, if he can't kill you, which he can't, death and life is in the power of what? Oh, Not in his power. If he could, he'd, he'd, he'd already done it. He can't kill you. So if he can't kill you, he's got to get you to agree with him in order to take you out early. Did you hear what I said? He's got to get you to agree with him. So he's got to get you talking like he talking, and then he can take you out. But if you don't agree with him, he can't do it. He doesn't power. If he can't kill you, which he can't, then what he tries to do is push you. Do something that you're not supposed to do. Do something faster than you're supposed to do it. Start watching this thing, and then you start, well, maybe, you know, maybe homosexuality ain't wrong, you know, maybe, maybe it's okay. There's no verse in scripture that says homosexuality is okay. Not one verse. Or maybe pride, a little pride is okay. Pride goes before a fall, not one verse. Not one verse. But he'll say, well, maybe, well, it's a little gray. Well, they love each other, and, and it, it's gray. And, and then you get over, well, well, maybe, maybe this book is old and outdated. Have you heard this? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's out old and outdated, and it doesn't apply. This is how he gets you. And you once were strong on the word of God, and now all of a sudden, uh, maybe Muhammad is the way. Maybe Buddha, 
maybe Joseph Smith is the way. And then you'll get to a place where you say, Jesus is not the only way. He's not it anymore. And now you have fallen away. And you've disconnected yourself. And you say, Pastor, do you believe in save, once saved, always save? I do not. I don't believe in once saved, always saved, because I believe you can choose willfully and deliberately to step away and say, I don't believe in it. We see it all throughout Scripture. People falling away and stepping away from once they once believed. So we either have to say they never had an experience with Jesus and they never were saved, right? Or we have to say they were and they deny. And because all y'all raised your hand and you were a candidate of all five of those things in Hebrews chapter, chapter four, you were a candidate, you say, I'm, or chapter six, I'm sorry, I'm a candidate, I'm a candidate, that means that then you have the wherewithal to know what decisions you're making and what decisions you're not. If you're a baby, there's, I, there's a, you know, I remember when my kids were baby. If you notice when you, your kids, many of you have been around kids, uh, children, when they were baby, they, they're kind of violent, huh? They used to swing their bottle at me, and I remember one of them hit me upside the head with their bottle, just, ah! Because it was a baby, I had a lot of patience. Now, if you would have done that, I would have took you down, okay? If you're an adult, God's the same way. If you're a baby, you don't know no better. There's, there's, there's some patience there. If you're a full-grown, mat mat mature adult and you know better, then, you, then it's willful and deliberate. So now I can't say you accidentally hit me in the head with that bottle. You, you knew what you was doing with that bottle. You tried to hurt me. You're 32 years old trying to hit me upside the head. You know better, right? This is what happens. The Lord spoke to me, and I'll end with this. People who are ashamed of their sin have not committed the unforgivable sin. People who feel convicted by the Holy Spirit in their hearts have not committed the unforgivable sin. People who are in fear that they have committed the unforgivable sin have not committed the unforgivable sin. And this is how you experience true life. Would you stand to your feet? For more information about True Life Fellowship Church, including service times and location information, please visit us online at truelifefc.org. Come experience your true life today.